Hey everyone, just wanted to give you all a heads up that in the first 15 minutes of this episode, there's three cases where the microphone gets a little scratchy, so um, just prepare yourself. Um, it's not super bad, but it's jarring if you don't know that it's coming. Um, we did solve it, and uh, the rest of the episode is fine, and the ones going forward will also be fine. Um, but this was just a new setup for us, so we were having some technical difficulties. Uh, but that's all. Just wanted to let you know. So thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to the first ever episode of the Nerdcast with John and Angelina. That's what it's called. I don't know why you laugh every time I tell you the name of the podcast, but that's what it's called. Anyway, um, first episode, I have a lot of different topics to go through throughout the series, but I think we're going to start with film and TV. What are you doing? <laughs> Silently trying to drink that is making it harder for me to concentrate. <laughs> Um, I'm going to kind of run this and treat Angelina like a guest, and we're kind of just going to go back and forth. I'm going to ask her a bunch of questions and see, you know, what type of answer she'll give me. Um, so, all right. I'll just start it. So, like, we have shows like The Mandalorian and, like, Game of Thrones and, you know, shows that obviously keep you on the edge of your seat, but are very cinematic, you know, um, but it's a new format as well, that most of the episodes are around an hour long, but the season itself is shorter. Is the, Man the Mandalorian episodes are an hour? Season two, they're closer to an hour. They're longer. I guess the producers kind of listen to the fans, because the first season they were shorter. I don't see the Mandalorian as being the same is Game of Thrones. I see Game of Thrones and, like, Westworld as being in the same type of category, because Westworld's kind of like mini-movies each night. Okay, well then, let's sub that for Mandalorian, Mandalorian instead. Mandalorian is, like, a classic TV show. It's like, there's a arc in each episode, it gets resolved by the end, and then there's, like, an overarching theme throughout the whole season, but it's kind of on the back burner for most of those episodes, and it doesn't come out until the very end. Whereas for, like, I mean, the HBO shows basically they're like epics yeah you know and yeah. each one has a major storyline and you get like little bits and pieces each week so i don't know i would that's something that hbo does a lot so they'll have these series that have basically like a whole film it's like an hour and a half long episode for each week and then i will look for westworld at least take some like four years to film the season okay because it's like making 10 movies exactly so i don't know but i consider that to be different than the mandalorian because the mandalorian to me is very much a classic tv show okay well then yeah let's sub out the mandalorian for westworld <clears throat> and we'll talk about those two shows but do you like that format like would you rather wait four years for season three and four of westworld to come out um or would you rather the episodes be shorter and the season be longer and have to wait less time? Because you're still getting the same story, but it's spread out in a longer season. Whereas right now, when you finally have your season and you have each episode every week, you get to sit down for an hour and a half and really enjoy it. But after the season's over, it's like, oh man, now I gotta wait like two years. And that's how we felt after watching season two and season three that came out recently. Well, not recently, but um, we were like, oh, it's over? Like, already? And season three was short, you know? But every episode was long. But the show was still amazing, but that format, like, would you rather it stay that way? Or down the line, would you prefer them to, with the same budget, the same effects, and the same things like that, would you rather them make it into, like, a 22-episode series, and each episode be more like 30 to 40 minutes, rather than an hour and a half? No, because I don't think that works for this format. For this type of show, do you mean? Yeah, yeah. I just, I feel like 
having uh, for some shows when you have an overarching arc like that and you try to split it into 22 episodes it feels like you're getting crumbs for the first like five episodes because like nothing's happening yeah and i feel like that to me that would be satisfying to sit there for 30 minutes or 20 minutes and watch you know just a tiny bit of what's supposed to be happening and then you know half a year later get the rest of it that's like ridiculous so i appreciate the way that westworld um you know times things out and i also feel like you know in in our world of netflix binging that this is kind of the way that people enjoy shows now is to have more at once instead of little bits and pieces at a time well that was going to be my next question is that do you think that that's going to be the direction that all the all tv shows go in no no because i don't think that cable is obsolete yet i think a lot of people still have cable subscriptions even if they also have streaming Mm -hmm. so and a lot of these streaming services aren't just doing you know like all at once some of them are doing like an episode each week just like disney plus was doing yeah so i think that they're kind of maintaining the format from cable even if it's going to be on a different platform, I don't think that paradigm is shifting. I think that that's going to stay pretty consistent. Because some people like to binge watch and some people don't. And I think for some people, if the, you know, you watch it all in one night, you watch like 10 hours of a show, it's kind of over. And then these streaming platforms aren't going to like that because it's not you coming back each week. Sure. And when you come back each week, then you see the coming attractions. You see, oh, there's a new movie or there's a new show, you know, because you have to see the banners when you open up the streaming service. So they're getting advertisements when you, you know, go in each week to see what's going on. So I think that that's in their best interest to keep that format going and it also builds anticipation too because it's like people are talking about it consistently for in some cases you know 10 to 20 weeks so you get 10 to 20 weeks of publicity for a good show if it's a bad show then people won't talk about it but for like disney plus for instance you know you've got yeah you got free press basically for weeks and weeks and people were really hyping it up for a while so I, you know, I think that that Disney for sure is going to keep doing that. And HBO, um, you know, they still release one episode at a time, even if they're longer episodes for their shows, but they get the same kind of press, you know, they release one and people analyze it. You know, there's like 15,000 Reddit threads (laughs) for like (laughs) one episode of Westworld and, you know, people spend days and weeks analyzing the same episode just to kind of like get all the meat out of it that they can. And HBO is getting, you know, an insane amount of press from doing that. So that's really the, I think that's the best format for these streaming services. And also for a lot of people too. Like I don't like to binge watch every episode because then it's over. And then you're like, oh, no, no, I got to wait like another year, two years. If it were Westworld, it'd be four years. So I don't know. Yeah. I, I do. I do appreciate that they do that. I guess it's the waiting. That's the worst part. But, there, I mean, that does build the anticipation. And you're right, it does help those properties to take some time away so that fans have a period of, oh, what's going to happen next? And everybody's talking about it still. Even after the season's over, there's still um, a lot of talk and a lot of action. Um, but, okay. Well, I mean, that, that makes sense. And you can't really do that for every, any just any show like the office Mm -hmm. you can't have um every episode be like an hour and a half because you'd get bored because it's not about something cinematic sitcom type of thing yeah so you know it's definitely it's different when it's like a fantasy or adventure type series and i think i i personally am willing to wait for westworld because i know the kind of quality that i'm going to get each season you know people have little like gripes and complaints about things that have happened but overall it's still a really really great series it's a fantastic show if you're gonna give me something that's like 10 movies 10 really good movies in a series i'll wait four years for it why not because we wait four years to see a good movie yeah that's true there's there's a lot and it's more spread out anyway with real movies with movies there's a lot of time that goes between some like people have been waiting for an avatar sequel for (laughs) 
Wow. Well, like I mean, eight years. There's news and now that they're going to get it. Oh, no, I know. They've already been filming, and they're like, you know, it's coming out in the next few years, and they have a bunch of them planned out yeah, for that, too. Yeah, it's a whole saga. But, I, you know, I just use that as, like, a point of reference. Is it, you know, they got a whole ride, <laughs> a whole land in Disney World, just, for, you know, for a movie that hasn't even gotten a sequel yet they claim is going to be a series. So people will wait a good amount of time for something if they think that it's going to be quality. So, and I think that that's, I think you kind of know what you're going to get. It's like if you waited four years for a sitcom, the excitement would kind of die off and be like, oh, okay. You know, like if people were like waiting four years for the big thing, theory, they'd be like, nah, <laughs> I don't really care anymore. Oh, well, I guess with a show like that, though, I mean, no offense to anybody who likes the Big Bang Theory, I did enjoy, you know, the first few seasons it was good, but... Like, you can't really compare that to, like, a show like, again, The Office or Parks and Rec, where you are waiting to see over time, oh, I mean, is Jim going to get with Pam? Is Michael going to find his his person? Or, you know, what's going to happen between Leslie and Ben? And there's more of a build-up, because, like, the characters in Big, The Big Bang Theory are kind of just, like, whatever. They're just here every week characters, you know? And I think it's Penny and Leonard who are, like, the, the couple in that show. And I was never really, like, sitting there thinking, like, you know, what's going to happen? Are they going to get together? I kind of just knew that they were going to get together because the way they play it in every episode, it's so predictable. And I guess if you have that level of predictability, then you don't really care about the outcome. But Well, there's not as much world building in those shows either. Also true. So there's less to think about as, you know a producer or writer it's kind of like you can just inject daily scenarios into the show and something happened to you and all of a sudden that could be an episode because it was funny yeah you know put in jokes that you like or things that you see or observe and that's you know part of the appeal of having a show like that is that it's relatively safe and easy to produce no offense to the people who made it but I, you know that's kind of the truth well they're not doing they're not breaking new ground <laughs> yeah with that we're show. With, and i didn't like game of thrones but with like <sighs> game of thrones or westworld like there is a lot of world building there and i mean of course um and you know the source material for game of thrones basically gave them a lot of the storylines but the source material for westworld was pretty weak there's those two movies so, right mm-hmm which were questionable and there was a book too there was yeah oh, i didn't know that um but that required a lot more work to make it into something that would be believable as like a futuristic type of fantasy series and not only that but like the level of special effects that they're doing and the ongoing storylines and character arcs and all of that it's it's much more cerebral i think than like the typical sitcom so that to me is worth waiting for because you have enough time to kind of digest it you don't really need time to like digest a sitcom from like CBS or NBC or ABC. You just kind of sit there and you watch it and it's fun. You laugh and then you turn it off and you go to bed. Yeah. Easy. It's very easy to consume. Yeah. Popcorn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, there are some shows that I guess stand out. Yeah, that's the, it's a dimmer function, I guess on the light, um, that are above the popcorn level, but most of them, yeah, most of those sitcoms nowadays. And that's another thing that I have to say about sitcoms and TV shows like that, is that I'm kind of just getting sick and tired of seeing the same things put to screen, and it's like that, um, like, and I know, you know, we kind of split hairs on this, but like the Hilary Duff, Lizzie McGuire, not reboot, but I guess reboot. Well, that's not happening anymore. No, but like, that was going to be about her, like, in the in New York City and like doing like her fashion thing and stuff like that and kind of like you know the little issues that she would have and the trouble that she'd get into there but I feel like we've seen so many TV shows that are like that like the what was that show that Hilary Duff is also in Younger or mm -hmm. something like that mm -hmm. where like it's just it's like Sex in the City it's just people in the city and they're living life and that's it there's really no you know, they're not breaking new ground, they're not trying to, you know, get a message across or say something important, it's just kind of, like, the same thing over and over again. Every episode is, like, are we having sex, or are we going out to eat dinner, or my job sucks, or my job's great, or I met this new person, and it's just, like, life. But for a lot of people, that is just life. That is, like, everyday life. Well, 
So there's nothing really like interesting about that that makes me want to go back and see an, another show that's like that or see a new episode from that show every week. Yeah, I, I could agree with you about you know Lizzie McGuire, and I felt kind of the same way about That's So Raven and Boy Meets World is that those were shows that I watched when I was younger, when they were in the original run, that I really enjoyed because they were, like, relatable, you know? They mm-hmm. were, like, well, maybe that's or even a little bit less, but, you know, some aspects of it. Um, but, like, Lizzie McGuire, for sure, was, like, every, like, preteen or teenage girl, like, growing up felt the way that she did and went through some of the things that she did in middle school and high school, and she felt very relatable because she was a real type of character who had real struggles and she was kind of goofy and clumsy and she wasn't like this perfectly manicured character that they just sent off and was like trying to build as a role model um she was just like an average girl and i think that was part of the appeal is that there weren't a lot of shows that were doing that but in that way, she was almost a role model because she, no, was, she was no, she the was average. a role model, but it wasn't like they were trying to like build the perfect girl. Yeah. You know, they were trying to just show like, hey, you know, it's okay to be normal. And it's okay to be, you know, kind of silly or to, you know, trip over yourself or spill all your lunch down your shirt. You know, like it's okay to do that and, you know, maybe not have you have like two friends. That's fine too. You know, so that was I think that's what people really resonated with with the original show and then you have her as like a fashion designer in New York and I'm like I just don't care you know like and that's great that that's how things turned out for her but I think they're missing the point of why we like the show in the first place which is that like we felt like we were Lizzie and Miranda and Gordo like they were kind of like the outcasts of the school kind of like the you know they weren't really popular but no, people didn't really, like, hate them. Mm-hmm. They were just kind of, like, there, and they had their own little group. They didn't have, you know, the whole school rallying behind them. They were just living their life. And it's good to see that things, you know, are turning out well for them or whatever, but that's not, that wouldn't keep me watching. And the same thing with, like, Boy Meets World. It's like, that show was revolutionary because of the type of topics that they covered. Yeah. And, um... You know, the, and I think they dramatized a lot of that in the same way they did with, like, Full House. Save but, the Bell. Yeah. But, um, you know, those were, like, shows that taught you a lesson while you were watching, but that also felt, you know, a, again, relatable to your life because they were going through things that kids went through. And that was something that was really appreciated. And then with, you know, when they did the reboot for Girl Meets World... It was definitely a manufactured Disney Channel type Absolutely. of show. Absolutely, yes. It was, very, a, they, it was a clear goal that they were trying to achieve with every episode and force that message down your throat. Yeah, they took away a lot of the grit from the original show that I thought kind of made it fun. And they kind of made it more goofy and, you know, really shiny and bright and the way that all the Disney Channel shows are. And that just took away a lot of it. And I think that, you know, they did the same thing kind of with That's So Raven. They did, they definitely did. I didn't even watch Fuller House, and I can tell already that they did the same kind of thing with that, too. Um, I think trying to put something from the 90s or early 2000s into this time period, like two decades later, doesn't have the same appeal. It just doesn't feel the same because it was a different... It was a different time period. We were going through different things. It felt, it just felt different. Well, the social norms are different now, and the problems that people are facing are different, and, you know, things have evolved, you know, in terms of, like, who is an outcast, and what does it mean to be an outcast, and how do you go about, you know, maneuvering through the obstacle course that is high school. You know, a lot of that has changed. And if you try to take a show that did it a certain way in the past and bring it now to the future, it's going to feel out of place. Um, but I think you're you're definitely right about Disney making everything shiny and pretty and trying to like appeal to everyone at once, and at the same time alienating a lot of people because they can't relate to those shows or those characters anymore. But do you think that that's a problem that 
all of these different networks are having. Like Nickelodeon, I think, does the same thing, and they have a lot of their shows that are very cookie cutter. You know, there's a, a girl or a boy who is who's in high school with two friends, and it's just kind of like every episode you learn a lesson, and it's like very on the nose. There is no like real stakes for these characters, and it's like nothing about it seems realistic, you know, like every every day they're just in school, they learn something, and then whoops, there's a joke, and that's it, the episode's over, and like, it's just like very, very repetitive. Yeah, and I think what they're doing really is doubting children's intelligence and capabilities, because it's so slapstick now, all these shows, Yeah, is that, you know, kids can understand more difficult messages, obviously, because we've watched shows that had real stuff in them, and they weren't super silly and goofy all the time. And I think that they kind of just moved into that over the years. Like, they, they dabbled in it a little bit with, like, Lizzie McGuire. Like, they had a little bit of silliness in there, but it wasn't, like, crazy. Um, and then they moved to, like, That's a Raven. That was definitely a lot sillier. Mm -hmm. You know, they had Raven, who was a big comedic character. And then after that, they jumped into, like, Hannah Montana, where they did a lot of slapsticky stuff. But they still, they still had a little bit of heart there. There was but realism to it, too. Like, I didn't was, watch a whole lot of was. those episodes, but, like, she was going through yeah, real yeah. problems. And then that was kind of, I think what they were trying to do is to replicate the success of that show. I think they've been trying to do that ever since. Because they made Miley Cyrus a major star. Yeah. But, you know, she was really not anyone to the public. Mm -hmm. And they you know created this entire persona and what they realize is that we can just build a pop star you know we can just find a girl off the street tell everyone that she should be famous and that you know give she has some talent so just well, give her she could sing and act oh yeah oh yeah she's very talented she's a great voice but you know they found this girl who had talent and they just like put her in a costume and put her on tv and told everyone she's famous right they like literally had her be hannah montana and then toured her around the country yeah, I was as say, Hannah they just Montana. Put her out on stage in real life. And I, first of all, I can't even imagine what that was like for you know Miley to go through all of that at twelve. But I just feel like they were trying to replicate that success ever since. And it did start with Hilary Duff too, because they tried to do it with her, and they had a little bit of success, but she kind of pushed back a little bit with the machine. She didn't really want to be involved with all of that. She wanted a stronger contract, and they wouldn't give it to her. And Miley just kind of went along with it, you know, because she was looking for the career like that. Yeah. And, um, you know, Disney is so controlling over all of their actors and actresses because they do create this image oh, well, of yeah. who they want. And I think that, you know, Nickelodeon probably is too, but to a lesser extent, because you typically don't hear about, you know, those kids either, with the exception of, like, Jamie Lynn Spears when she was <laughs> a teen. She does but, Zoe 101. Yeah. But, you know, it's it's probably in all of those contracts that, like, you can't do this or you can't do that. There's, like, a lot of pressure from these kids' networks, like, to do this and to do that. And it's all part of the image. And I think that translates into the shows, too, is that they want clean cut. They want, you know, like, they've designed what they think kids like. But you can tell that, like, they didn't actually ask a child. You know, there's no, like, focus group there. there. A, they yeah. just kind of think, like, this is what kids think is funny because it's silly and kids are silly. And they are, but, you know, there's a lot of different, you know, kids are people, too. You know, there's a lot of different layers there. And I think that there's just such a low expectation now that that's kind of where we've set the bar. Is that, like, kids like this type of show and that's it. So you don't really see another kid's show. I The one show, I haven't seen it, but I've heard quite a lot about it. Andy Mack on Disney Channel. Nope. Yeah. I haven't heard anything about it. Um, That was one that kind of cut the mold a little bit that's sort of like more of an old fashioned if I hate to say it but Disney show where they deal with like real issues and they put her into like different situations and that's on now I don't know if it's still on but I know that it was on a few years ago okay. and it got a lot of press for how it was dealing with like real life situations and that that character was like a good role model for kids and it was just different than what they had on there so maybe they're trying to like stray away from what they did you know, like five to ten years ago, but <clears throat> that really seemed like what they were doing was like trying to replicate the success of that particular show. And I think Nick was kind of trying to replicate the success of like 
some of the 90s shows that they did, like the Amanda show. Oh, yeah. You know, and all that. And they were trying to sort of put that, like, crazy energy into everything. And so they did, like, Drake and Josh, which was enjoyable. I love that show. And then they did iCarly, which was a little bit, a little bit weirder, but still, you know, enjoyable to watch. I don't think that really clicked with me as much as Drake and Josh did, but... You know, they had that, and then they had Sam and Cat, which oh, is like yeah. a spinoff. They were just trying to build off of the same group of characters for years. I think years. I, Carly though, was kind of right in the middle. It was like, had that lovable quality of Drake and Josh, but it was like leaning more towards like that newer style that eventually became Sam and Cat. And I think after I, Carly, all the shows going forward were just kind of like you said before slapstick comedy with like no substance Mm -hmm. um well and uh, to be fair all that and the amanda show were kind of like slapsticky and ridiculous they were like sketch but they were were doing something new at the time because amanda the all that show was kind of on par with like mad tv and like a children's version of uh snl it you was. Know. Yeah, it's exactly what it was. It had, like, an ensemble cast, and they were all doing sketches and stuff. Yeah. I, I always really enjoyed those shows, and I, I think that the Nickelodeon shows were always goofier in the 90s than the Disney shows were. Yeah. Because I don't, I mean, I don't think you remember most of the Disney shows. I don't remember you... any Disney shows other than, like, Sweet Life of Zack and Cody and That's a Raven and stuff like that. But and I really Lizzie enjoyed, McGuire from like, my childhood. so weird which was like really so weird like it was like really bizarre Mm -hmm. because they had this girl who was like investigating like basically the paranormal oh that's awesome um and i really enjoyed that that was that was definitely not like slapsticky at all they had like the famous jet jackson um you know like a lot of the 90s shows were nothing like nothing like what they have on tv now they were definitely more serious and it seemed like It really did seem like they gave kids a little bit more credit for, like, what they would watch and enjoy. And then it just kind of went downhill in the early 2000s. And, you know, maybe they're bringing it back. Maybe they're realizing that that model doesn't really work anymore. I don't know. I don't know what their next move is. But I think that that was part of the problem is that they saw that, oh, these types of characters are successful. So let's do more. Yeah. You know, let's more, 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 more of that. And they were focusing on the wrong things. I think and trying to build brands for each of these shows instead of focusing on you know trying to make the best possible show and the most enjoyable show for these kids but that's I mean, kind of where I think it went <laughs> yeah well I mean and I hope eventually it kind of turns around and goes back towards the way things were in the past but I don't know how quickly we're gonna get there because of like the culture of shielding your children from everything you know there's just so much that i don't want them to learn about or know so early but they should be prepared for when they get to that in their adult life or their young adult life you know so many of these shows are like oh no i got a bad grade on my test or my the bully spilled milk on my shirt and stuff like that but that's not all high school is like there's a lot more that happens in a real high school that they do not include in those shows so, like, when you watch that, it's like, this isn't really getting it, you know? You're not really getting the message across for anybody who needs to watch the show and be like, how do I deal with this situation right now? I don't want to talk to an adult. Where's the answer? Mm-hmm. And you're not going to find it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, that's definitely real. And that's something that shows used to address a lot you know like boy meets world full house roseanne roseanne but Um, boy meets world like yeah you said it before i think is an amazing example of that because there were so many episodes where they like talked about depression and like in like there was one episode i forget which season it was later though i think they even talked about suicide and stuff like that you know and i know this got very dark very quickly but that it's real those are real topics that shows don't really touch on a whole lot anymore because it's more like It's like a cartoon with real people, is basically all it is. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's exactly. It's very manufactured. But Lizzie McGuire used to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, they talked about her getting her first bra and, like, sneaking into an R-rated movie and getting invited to a high school party when she was, um, you know, in in middle school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And feeling uncomfortable because of all the things that were happening there. You know, and, like, Miranda had an eating disorder and um, they showed, like, 
Gordo's um, bar mitzvah, which you don't really see that often on TV either. No. Like, you don't really see, like, real things that happen to kids. Yeah. So, I don't know. I, I think that that was kind of... I think that that was kind of when they were giving kids a little bit more credit mm-hmm. for what they could handle. And I'm kind of hopeful that, you know, this, the millennial generation of parents will be more open and accepting to having different types of shows for kids and maybe they will be willing to you know have the same type of 90s kids shows yeah available i don't know because i know that i would be fine with kids you know watching that kind of show because i did and i turned out okay and these parents are you know around our age a little bit older and they all grew up with the same material But some of them took the approach of, like, this is what I grew up with and this is my childhood and I need to right all the wrongs that I felt. And they're, like, going in the complete opposite direction that our parents did. And then some of them are like, well, that worked for me, so let's do more of that. I feel like that happens in every generation, too. But I think it'll be interesting to see as these kids, you know, grow up and see the cultural landscape, you know, start to shift. Kids are still watching adult stuff. Oh, true. You I mean, know? now they're just doing it, like, secretly. Yeah, all of the time. If you ask a kid, they'll be like, yeah, I've seen, like, Deadpool, you know? And South Park, I remember. <laughs> when I was younger, yeah. that was the thing. Is yeah. that, like, oh, you're watching South Park? Like, oh, man, what's your favorite episode? And it was, like, hush, hush. Like, no, we're, you know, don't talk about it out loud. But... Family Guy. Oh, Family yeah. Guy, definitely. Family Guy, a little... I mean, Family Guy's definitely up there, but a little less so because... A lot of the jokes and humor are kind of like potty humor and like Seth Green and um, I haven't seen either of those Robot shows, Chicken. So I really don't know, but I mean, I remember kids talking about it when I was in school. Yeah. And um, yeah, and I I hear kids talking about it all of the time now too. So they're still watching those things, even if you don't like. So popular, yeah. Yeah, even if you don't put it in a format that's appropriate for them, it doesn't mean that they won't still have access to it. Because kids have access to basically everything that they could possibly want now. You give them a phone and they have access to everything in the world. Yeah. So they're going to discover stuff. You just have to make sure that, you know, you're there to supervise and you give them, you know, the right tools that they need in order to be able to process what they find and that they feel comfortable talking to you about those issues. Yeah. So that's how I feel about it. I think that it's fine to incorporate kid-friendly versions of those messages. I think that's probably better because kids are going to ask you questions and have problems, and if you never address it with them, they're going to go looking for answers on their own, and it doesn't mean the answer they're going to get is going to be a good one. Yeah. Yeah. You have access to the internet. You're going to find all sorts of things. So you don't want to land on the wrong one. Um, But I will pivot, take a hard pivot now, to a different topic and lighten things up a little bit. Um... Recently, not very recently, but a few weeks ago, um, we were watching the Oscars. Mm-hmm. And Boo. and what? Boo. Boo? Boo. Yeah. The Oscars this year, it was very, very boring. Um, and it was very hoity-toity. And I understand like this because of 2020 has not been a great year for movies, so they didn't really have a whole lot to put out there. Um, but... I've noticed a trend with almost every year with the Oscars is like excluding the year that Black Panther came out, I don't really see movies that I find interesting in the running for best this or best that. If it's not best music or best visual effects, it's not going to be there. Um, And especially watching this most recent Oscars, I was very lost. I was like, I had never... some of the movies. Some of them, yeah. I mean, Judas and the Black Messiah, but, like, there was, like, three movies that I was like, oh, yes, this has to win, like, the and the um, subsequent movie film. Mm-hmm. I was like, please, let this win, because it's the only thing that I recognize, you know? It's the only thing that I know it has to win. And it did, they did. Um, and Judas and the Black Messiah, just from every angle absolutely perfect movie should have won all the awards fantastic but do you think that going forward in the oscars they should include like a best blockbuster film award for movies like star wars and the avengers and things like that that 
yes, it's not saying something specifically like, you know, about race or politics or like trying to break new ground, but especially with the Avengers, like even Endgame, you, you've brought 21 to 22 movies to a close perfectly while not leaving any loose ends, having incredible acting, great visual effects, and a film that could perfectly stand on its own if not for all the other, like, without all the other movies, like, of course, you know, people would be lost, but just the way the film was produced, the way it was made, it's a very good film, other than just being an amazing blockbuster movie that made so much money, but, like, it's never really recognized, like, and then we watched the MTV Movie Awards, and they had WandaVision, and The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, and a bunch of movies, and, TV, and um, Cobra Kai, and stuff like that, and TV shows that were like, yeah, like, I feel like more people are talking about this stuff, and are interested in these things, Baby Yoda and The Mandalorian, like, this is what is hot right now, this is what people want to see win awards, why is it not featured in one of the most prestigious award ceremonies? Because, like, somebody like... Robert Downey Jr., he took that role of Iron Man and just became Iron Man. Like, you cannot pull them apart. They're inseparable at this point, you know. And that might be a detriment to him going forward because, you know, he's going to get typecasted. But um, he is an amazing actor, and I think he did a fantastic job. What? I don't think Robert Downey Jr. is going to get typecast. He was extremely famous before he became Iron Man. Sure, but like... He had a very well-known career. He was an well, excellent No, actor. you're definitely right. But I mean, like, I feel like seeing him getting a lot of roles in the future that are like, oh, he's a sarcastic guy and is kind of like full of himself. He's always kind of gotten roles like that, though. He's done some sillier things and some really serious things, like he The Judge. He has. Yeah, he and, has, um, has, but... uh, what was that one about the silent comedian, Groucho Marx? Mm. Didn't he do that movie, too? I don't know. That I, don't he had the, I forget what the movie was called, but I feel like he, that was him in that role. It was like the silent black and white about that comedian. Maybe. I'm not really sure what you're talking about, but maybe. Mm, okay. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, I don't think he'll be typecast, and I think that he's big enough of a star that he could kind of pick and choose what he wants, mm -hmm. you know, so I don't think that's ever going to be a concern for him. Okay, well, I mean, okay, but my point being, um, that I feel like a lot of people put a lot of hard work into those movies, and I wouldn't say, like, a movie like Transformers or, like, Pacific Rim or, like, Jurassic World should go in there. Maybe Jurassic World, the first one, because of how much of a blockbuster success it was. But, like, um, Avatar as well. You know, like, a movie like that should win multiple awards. It did. It did at the time? It did. I'm pretty sure it won Best Picture, actually. It did? I'm pretty sure. Okay. But, like, If you... it didn't win, it was at least nominated. Okay. But do you, like, would you agree that, like, movies like that should have at least a slot in the awards where you could showcase who did it best this year? You know, who, you know, what's the biggest spectacle? Who, which movie brought in the most money? You know, which one, like, tied a story up nicely, you know? Or do you think, like, that should just be saved for something like the MTV Movie Awards? A little more low scale for... Well, the MTV, I think it's a difficult comparison because the MTV Movie Awards are voted on by people. Okay. Like random people. Then what's another good one? Because well, Emmys, that's like TV shows. Oh, like the Golden Globes? Golden Globes, okay. Those are voted on by the Hollywood Foreign Press. So I'd say it's about as elitist as the Oscars. Um, and that's kind of the whole problem with the machine anyway. Is that it's, all of these award shows are so self-congratulatory and they are elitist and it is very much just the same few people who get to decide you know what works and what doesn't and I, in truth the people who make those type of epic movies that you're talking about aren't making them for the academy no. they're not making them for hollywood foreign press they're making them for a specific fan base of people and their reward for making those movies is a huge paycheck. Sure. So they don't need yeah. the award ceremonies. And no, I'm sure that's nice right. for some people to, you know, to earn that. I'm sure that's a wonderful feeling. 
but I don't think that anyone at Marvel or Disney is heartbroken that they've never won Best Picture. I just don't really feel like that's what they're going for. No. Because if you're going to make a work of art, like you're going to make a very artsy type of film, and you, you know, you have a very specific vision for it, it's all original source material, you've built this world, and it's epic, um, and it's kind of the same way as Avatar, and you didn't win or at least be nominated for best picture i can see that type of director producer creator being upset mm -hmm. with that type of snub but if you're making a superhero movie you're not really expecting to win best picture because you know that you're using popular culture as the backbone of your material and you understand already that popular culture is not in line typically with what is rewarded by you know the Hollywood elite so I think that going into it you already know what to expect and so it's not really a disappointment it would be more of a surprise if you were to get nominated for something like that because you know that it's not really meant for what you're making so I, no I don't really think that there should be you know a blockbuster category for an award show like that that's just so ridiculous in nature anyway it's like, you don't need that, you know? And I'm sure for some people, just like earning, you know, a, an award from the people is enough and getting the, you know, reward of several billion dollars for this film is more, more than enough. And then the promise of a continued paycheck because of how well that you've done. So, well, I guess I don't, and I think that if you make, if you make a movie like that and you put enough into it to make it on par with the movies that are nominated and I'm, I'm not saying this to put down the films that are nominated for best picture or for you know best actor actress because I enjoy most of those films that are nominated and I think that they're very well made and that they're very deserving of the awards that they've gotten but I just feel like the whole machine is completely you know messed up so to to say well there should be more categories that can you know fit these specific types of films I you know why even bother trying to shoehorn something like that into a word show that already kind of stinks that's just kind of my opinion of it I just don't really like think that. that it's necessary and I remember you know when the Dark Knight came out that was you know very celebrated too it was a superhero movie that was that used the source material but made it into something that was a little bit more artsy, you know? Mm. It was a little deeper, it was a little darker. It was a film that you could watch and enjoy, even if you weren't a fan of superheroes or of Batman. Yeah. Whereas with a lot of the Marvel movies, while they do have universal appeal, no one is watching those movies and thinking, this is Oscar bait, you know? They're just waiting for the Oscar to come. No one's really thinking that about those types of movies. You're definitely right, but I also wouldn't have said that about Batman either. Because no, compared I, yeah. to what I normally see as Oscar bait, Batman, obviously, I mean, to me, would be better, but it's very, it stands out completely. Because when you think of Oscar bait, it's a, it's a dramatic movie, or it's a foreign movie, or it's a movie that talks about... You know, it's an autobiography or something that's like talking about politics or something very serious, you know. It's, you don't really see a lot of light-hearted, fun movies get voted into that, that category, you know. And for the most part, like, that's why, like, Judas and the Black Messiah, I was so gung-ho for it. Because even though while watching that that ceremony it was one of the only movies that i recognized but while watching it with you i was like this is amazing everything about this is amazing you know i wasn't bored i was confused i wasn't angry i was just i just really enjoyed it and i really just kind of fell into that time period and the way the movie was crafted it was just so perfect so it did deserve to win the it didn't awards. make you angry at all like when when i saw i mean it, it it's it's very different. Like when I saw um, Black Klansman, mm -hmm. I left that theater very agitated and angry. And that was another really good movie. But like, I was mad at the movie. But with Judas and the Black Messiah, I was mad 
for the characters in the movie. But I wasn't, like, angry myself after watching it. You know, like, while uh, I watched the movie, I was like, that, just effing people, you know? And I was like, you know, this is wrong, and, you know. But after I watched it, I was like, that was just, it was so good. It was so perfect. But after watching um, the Black Klansman, I just felt very different. Felt a lot of different emotions. But I still enjoyed that movie. I thought it was great. But that that's another one that's very Oscar bait heavy. You know? Well, it was nominated as well. Yeah, yeah, I know. But before that even got nominated, I could have just looked at the trailer and been like, yeah, this will be this will be in the awards for sure. Because you can just tell, you know? Well, it didn't end on a hopeful note. and so Certainly not. But, but, but it came out at I not think, a very hopeful time. No, but I think that that's fair. I think that that's fair because even looking back, you can't really say things are so much better, you know? So for it to end on a hopeful note, I think would be rewriting history and what is happening now. Sure, but it didn't have to end. I mean, Judas and the Black Messiah didn't necessarily end on a hopeful note either. The final scene of the movie, before they showed you like the real footage, was, well, no, never mind. Spoilers. I won't say it. But not, you know, full of hope and promise, you no. know. Well, yeah, but it was still somehow more... It was still somehow more um, positive, I guess. Yeah, yes, it was. So because I they think, talked about what they were going to do for right, the future and right. change. And I think that that was maybe what made you a little less upset about yeah. it but yeah uh yeah and i think that both of those movies were obviously going to get nominated because of you know the way that they were written and acted they were they were works of art really but that's kind of my point is that the oscars rewards you know artistic ability basically they go for the films that are you know, fitting into the mold of what they expect from a movie when they go in. And, you know, most of the time, those types of movies that you're talking about, like the blockbuster films, are meant to entertain, but not really much beyond that. And I think that that's the difference between the movies that you would consider to be Oscar bait and the movies that you look forward to seeing each year. It's typically the movies that end up on the Oscars either you don't want to see or I'm kind of like can we watch this and you're like no, okay so we'll watch it and then you'll be like well that was a good one though or ones you know? that I've never even heard of well oh yeah well, I mean, that's so what I, well, yeah. often I will see like where was this movie like wh like it just came out of nowhere and then you'll find out later like yeah it was in like select theaters or you know they kind of just did like a short viewing but somehow it was in select theaters and they had a limited run but it's still being nominated, but that's, in that, you can see, has nothing to do with what the people think. No, well, because the critics saw it yeah. and enjoyed it. But, so. and there's movies that, you know, we've seen that you didn't understand, you know, like Dunkirk, for example, that was nominated, and you were oh, like, I don't boy. really, I don't Dunkirk. know, we'll get you started, but, you know, that was one that you saw, and you're like, oh, oh my, really? You know, and you felt that was Oscar bait, too, and it ended up being nominated, but that's, like, that's the artistry that they're aiming for. And it's just a totally different category than the types of movies that, like, you, for example, you personally enjoy watching. You know, you love the blockbusters, and who doesn't? Like, that's what most people enjoy. Well, that's there's why a, I mean, yeah. There's a very specific type of moviegoer who enjoys, you know, Oscar bait type films. And I think that those moviegoers are probably in line with, with where most of these critics are, too. But I think that's a whole different discussion, too, is that, you know, it's it's mainly based around these these critics and and the Hollywood elite and what they consider to be good and that's a you know a whole question about you know what is art what is good you know what what makes a good film and what should be rewarded and what shouldn't and I think that's you know a conversation that's always shifting but I agree I but yeah I mean I think those movies do deserve more recognition for what they are able to achieve and how they use technology and things like that. Well, they do. But, They've yeah. been nominated for special effects. Yeah, and no, I remember like when Harry Potter and... was coming out, those movies got nominated for a lot 
for hair and makeup, for music. set design, for music, for visual effects. Mm -hmm. And that was fantastic. Um, and I guess, sure, um, some movies that are blockbusters really don't deserve that because they're just kind of like ghosts, like The Meg with Jason Statham. Like, no one, you know, that, that was a blockbuster movie because of... It's just a giant shark. Everybody come see a giant shark. It's summertime. You know, it was another Jaws. But nothing about that movie was like, wow, they did that? It's groundbreaking. Like, you know, the shark was CGI, and, like, all the shots were kind of the same, so nothing really interesting there. But, so, I mean, Jurassic World, the first one, did do some pretty cool things, some pretty new things, and still was using practical effects in some areas and stuff like that. And, uh, Force Awakens, you know, like, I don't know. I just think that a lot of heart gets put into those films, and I think they just deserve a little more praise, a little well, more Well, they do get nominated for sign. Oscars. I think whether they get nominated for Best Picture or not is a different question. I think that being nominated for Best Picture has different criteria than just being nominated for some part of the movie. And I think the things that they're rewarded for are the strong points. You know, the, the strong points of those blockbuster films is is the effects, right? The visual effects, the sound effects, the, you know, the costume designs and the makeup artistry and all of that. Those are the, those are the strong points of those films. Yeah. That's where they focus most of that artistic ability. And so to be recognized in that way, I think makes sense. Yeah, I would agree. I was just looking up because like, um... While we were discussing it, I was curious as to why we use the term blockbuster for big movies like that. And did in you my that up before you did this. In my mind, no, because it just came to me now. Like I wasn't planning on making you know such a big point of that. Um, but in my mind, I was like, well, probably because a movie so popular, you have so many people wrapped around the block. You know, like I don't know, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it has nothing to do with that at all. Um, it, it actually has origins in, uh, World War II. It's crazy. Hmm. Yeah, the blockbuster, as the word blockbuster has wartime origins, though not from the First World War, but the second, used because of their ability to destroy an entire city block, but I don't know why that has anything to do with movies. Anyway, this has been fun. Well, those are some interesting topics and some interesting points that you brought up. I think the whole point of you doing this podcast was to literally just sit here and let me rant. You came up with topics that you thought I could talk about for a long time and you just let me go. Well, you have, because I've noticed when we sit and talk that you have a <laughs> lot of interesting opinions. Do you and I? Yes. I don't know if anyone else And I feel like so. we often go on for like hours talking about things like comic book characters and movies and video games and th things of that nature so i thought hey why not let's just do this for the channel as well and uh, i don't know hopefully you guys like it i hope you know this goes well and you want to hear more from us but um we're gonna have a few more episodes <laughs> uh i have like about 10 more episodes planned for like the first se uh, season um and then we'll just kind of go from there. But thank you so much for listening. Um, you can find both of us on Instagram. You can find me at JB underscore visual arts. And you can find Angelina at spooky sandwich. Six six? I think that's what it is. She posts nothing. So, but she still has over a hundred followers, which <laughs> drives me absolutely insane because of how hard I had to work for my first 100 followers. Am I over 100? You're at like 150. 147. 147, okay. It's still over 100. It was ridiculous. And you don't do anything. <laughs> it drives me mad. But, so, please, if you listen to this podcast, go follow me first. He's and then follow art. Angelina so that I feel like I'm gaining more followers. Um, but it's not a competition. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, if I posted more things, I would lose followers probably. I think they follow me because they know they don't have... They kind of forget that they followed me. I think that's it. They I follow think me because people... I follow them, and then they're like, oh, well, she's not even posting anything, so who cares? Uh, well, I don't follow people if they don't post anything. Like, if I have a follower, and I go and I see that they have nothing, but they somehow have, like, 800 followers, I'm like, well, I'm not going to follow you. You don't have any posts, and you still have 800 followers. Like, I know, no I thanks. Like spam. I look yeah, spammy. It does. It sure does. Um... So I don't do that, but there will be times where, yeah, like people will forget that they followed me and they're like, oh, that's right. You don't do stuff like that anymore, I guess. So I'm going to unfollow because at first I, all I was doing was sculptures mm. and I guess and people like me. that and pictures of, yeah, pictures of you and talking about like just life. And now that I'm more focused on art and like various types of art, I've lost some people. Yeah, so, they were just in it for the pictures of me. Those are the people sucks. following me, probably. Yeah, well, they were like, oh, there we go. And I could, because I'll, I'll at you in a post, and they'll just be like, <laughs> that's who she is? Okay, I'm going to follow her. And they go over and follow you instead. And then they discover she's got no no pictures. Maybe she'll post something eventually. <laughs> Drives me absolutely insane. But, um, yes, so go follow us on Instagram, and tune in next time for another episode of The Nerdcast. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.